Anyways, uh, next one is uh, Madison Fihan, and uh, she's going to talk about space copy technology for ISRU enabled lunar manufacturing. Madison is the CEO of, uh, uh, and uh, I think the co founder of uh, uh, Space Copy, and uh, anyway, co founder of uh, Moon Trades. So she's an entrepreneur. She's based in Edmonton, Alberta, and has worked with uh, NASA on planetary science, heliophysics, and astrophysics. So, uh, Madison, uh, please take the floor. All right. Thank you very much, Nicholas, for the introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope my audio is okay. I'm going to begin uh, sharing a presentation in just one moment. Uh, while I'm pulling that up, I just wanted to say, first of all, thank you so very much for taking the time out of your busy schedules to join us today for International Moon Day. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you. And I hope that all of you enjoy this brief presentation about what we are doing at Space Copy with regards to lunar manufacturing technologies and also how we are applying the material science of lunar regolith as a building material for infrastructure. So hopefully my presentation is now visible. I will now begin my presentation. Thank you. So uh, before we dive into the actual technology itself, I just wanted to further introduce myself and my background for a bit of additional context. So um, as Nicholas introduced, I am the founder and CEO of Space Copy and co-founder and CFO of Moon Trades. Um, Space Copy is, of course, the lunar additive manufacturing company that I've come here to speak with all of you about. And Moon Trades is a STEM education platform and lunar mining robotics uh, startup industry that is based in United States, Europe, and Canada. Uh, in addition, my background does come from a few years' experience at NASA's uh, NRES division where we've studied um, numerous different things. Um, my main focus was in infrared spectroscopy methodology for in situ resource applications. Uh, I also serve as a subcommittee advisor to the United Nations Committee on Peaceful Use of Outer Space and as the region chair of space technology and aviation for the province of Alberta, Canada, where I call home. Uh, of course, yes, I am an entrepreneur. My background is in commerce. I do a lot of lobbying for the National Small Business Association when it comes to promoting STEM industry, being a greater part of both the national economy in the United States and the global economy of the world. And I'm excited to share with you all some of the exciting research that we have developed at Space Copy. So first and foremost, let me introduce to you the concept of lunar manufacturing. In essence, lunar manufacturing is the usability of space resources or in situ resource utilization and the roles of additive manufacturing for lunar infrastructure and colonization efforts encompass how technologies like 3D printing and other additive methods of 3D printing are able to create infrastructure, precision tooling and repair parts and so much more using the resources that are locally available, mainly lunar soil or regolith. Um, first, I would like to speak about the value of space resources. Space resources themselves are unique, offering supply chain management and infrastructure development through usability of local resources, you are enabled to be able to extract them for manufacturing, life support systems, and all basic systems that encompass colonizing on the lunar surface. In particular, some of the earlier stage technologies that are being sincerely and severely looked at for projects like Artemis revolve around four main criteria, in situ construction, mining, agriculture, and clean energy. Being able to industrialize all four of these sectors within the space industry is pivotal to us being able to colonize space for a long-term basis. And in doing so, it is absolutely essential to be able to understand the compositional structure and capabilities of regolith as a building material and as a material for numerous different applications outlined herein. Uh, first, I will speak on composition. So generally speaking, and of course this does depend on location, be it highlands or mare, regolith tends to have very high concentrations of uh, oxides, which can be of course converted into oxygen upon uh, heat treatment. It also has very high ratios of silicon oxide and aluminum oxide. 
these rich resources within the regolith, along with trace amounts of uh, helium-3, iron, volatile organic compounds, and many more, are able to be encompassed within the particulate, which causes regolith to have a very vermicular shape or an angular and abrasive shape with customizable, uh, customizable particle size distribution. What this means is because of the mineralogy of regolith, it bears a very similar composition to ceramics. That being stated, despite the fact that the particles do not achieve roundness, we are able to actually beneficiate or process this regolith and transform it into a material that is more better enabled for lunar construction. Additive manufacturing in its capabilities for space has over 35 years of research spanning more than 12 different methods of 3D printings for specific applications in aerospace and defense, such as sintering, melting, extrusion, deposition, resin casting, and more. The production of precision tools, repair parts, interlocking bricks for habitats and roadways, berms, trusses, and other items using in situ resource utilization is very, very important to the lunar economy, and I will explain why. Not only from a scientific perspective, but also from the perspective of economics. The cost of sending a payload to space is currently equated at 1.2 million US dollars per kilogram of supplies. It is estimated that in order to be able to sustain astronauts on the lunar surface for one year, and um, assuming that we do end up sending crews in increments of four, as outlined by Artemis, that requires an upwards of 22,000 kilograms of supplies delivered per annuum. That factor of 22,000 kilograms multiplied by the $1.2 million per kilogram price tag of sending supplies to space means that we will spend over $6 billion trying to keep humans on the moon for one year alone. And that's assuming that nothing goes wrong. And that does not even start to equate things like what technology needs to be set up before they get there, what uh, funding is being placed in order to actually get them from Earth to space. These things take time, they take money, and ultimately, in situ resource utilization is a capable way of actually reducing that cost factor of up to 70% when it comes to resupply payloads. That being stated, the technology does have its challenges. Uh, reduced gravity down to one-sixth, temperature gradient extremes as low as around negative 125 degrees Celsius, in those non-permanently shadowed regions of the lunar south pole, as well as radiation exposure from solar flares and dust mitigation from electrostatically charged particles remain prevalent uh, inhibitants when it comes to being able to develop hardware technology for space, and more specifically, when it comes to developing additive manufacturing technology for space, it is essential to be able to overcome these technical difficulties. About Space Copy, we are a startup company based in the United States and Canada, developing 3D printing systems to create infrastructure in extreme environments, both on Earth and in space, using in situ resources as feedstock. For our terrestrial applications on Earth, what we mainly do is take a regular material such as soil or sand and convert it into a feedstock through a beneficiation process that involves crushing, mixing, sieving and vibrationally separating particles in order to create a high durability feedstock with a particle size distribution of no more than 50 microns. In space, we replicate this technology. Instead, we'd enhance it by also including the use of an in-vacuum system, swapping out the need for inert gas for laser powder bed fusion technologies and also maintaining a constant internal temperature, pressure, an ambient state within the 3D printer, regardless of what 3D printing method is being implemented, which is essential when it comes to manufacturing in reduced gravity environments and atmospheres that do not exist, such as on the lunar surface. The goals here, not just from an economic benefit, but to also advance ISAM, or in space assembly and manufacturing research and development, prioritizing the expansion of scalable infrastructure for Earth, Moon, and Mars, and accelerating ongoing efforts for the emerging commercial space industry. This vision is not only important to us as a company, but to each individual member of our team, being able to contribute to this industry and give some meaning back into how we're applying the science, how we're looking at the materials that are being encompassed into in-situ resource utilization and utilizing them for something tangible and important is absolutely a priority when it comes to being able to explain the value proposition of why 3D printing in space 
is now coming to a fruition. Um, speaking now to lunar additive manufacturing at a glance, first I want to debate some of the geotechnical properties of lunar regolith, uh, specifically from Apollo 16 and 17. Uh, Apollo 16 and 17 regolith, which was more of an equatorial regolith recovered during the Apollo era, was found to have a very high content of silicon oxide with trace amounts of metal content. This mineralogy bears a similar geotechnical properties to what Chandrian 3 was able to recover in its surveying yellow, uh, last year when it was deployed to the South Pole's surface. Specifically, the fine particles of silicates, including basaltic material and glassy volcanic debris, allows for that composition, again, to bear very similar properties to ceramics. Predominantly fine grains with a varying size up to a few millimeters on topsoil allows for suitable processes and breakdowns of the material with very little interference, with density ranging from around 1.2 to 1.9 grams per centimeter cubed, varying with depth, of course, and location. Porosity in regolith is high in this region due to irregular packing of particles, averaging around 40 to 50 percent, with a generally low permeability with um, limited ability to retain water, vapor, or gases. Um, cohesive strength is typically low when it comes to lunar south pole regolith, influenced by compaction and surface exposure. And the thermal properties do generally show high thermal conductivity, which is, of course, very essential for thermal management in lunar habitats and equipment. Uh, last but not least, um, the chemical composition, again, tracing back to the amounts of silicon, there's also a high amount of calcium, aluminum, and iron with very trace amounts of water, ice, and volatile compounds, which allow for those regolith characteristics to be further enhanceable when it comes to 3D printing. Ultimately, what all of this means is that the, re the lunar regolith that was recovered during Apollo 16 and 17, which can be reconstructed into simulants for research and development testing, is the most close thing that we can possibly get to simulating the South Pole. And in the data that has been recovered from South Pole missions, we are able to ascertain that this specific type of Highlands regolith is most likely to be able to work when it comes to 3D printing due to both its geological and mechanical properties. Speaking also about mechanical properties, the microstructure of regolith compared to ceramics boasts its potential for being able to be melted, sintered, or fused. Its compressive strength is suitable for structural applications after appropriate compaction and binding. And though we do have concerns about fracture behavior uh, relative to its overall brittle, uh, brittleness, being able to handle and process the material effectively does reduce that cracking and porosity. Speaking now about how to ultimately enhance how regolith is 3D printed, the most logical thing that can be implemented, and as I previously stated in the beginning of my presentation, is to conduct these 3D printing experiments under vacuum conditions. Technologies like electron beam melting were made to function under vacuum already, and given the fact that the lunar surface has no atmosphere, it is absolutely essential to adapt the vacuum condition system to any type of 3D printing that's being done on the lunar surface. At Space Copy, we are developing two different systems one that is extrusion-based using fused deposition modeling, and the secondary one uses a selective laser melting, a type of laser powder bed fusion. While these processes would generally use oxygen or inert gas to be able to control printer functions, reducing the Earth dependency by actually enabling a vacuum system not only ex uh, offsets external conditions of space, but improves process parameters and reduces the overall cracking, porosity, and dust that is being adhered to throughout the optics and other vital factors inside the 3D printer, causing there to be less dust buildup and a longer lifespan of equipment with more dense and durable parts. In conjunction, our beneficiation process, which allows the breakdown of lunar regolith, utilizes autonomous robotics to be able to control this function from wherever you are. So whether there are uh, astronauts present or not, we have the ability to optimize morphology and compatibility between the regolith and the 3D printer. Last but not least, while this beneficiation process is occurring, we utilize Raman spectroscopy to be able to determine mineralogy and further compositional structures of the lunar materials to see what process parameters that we can further enhance within the 3D printer before we reach the printing and cooling stage. 
all of this is technology is absolutely essential to be able to develop a hardware piece that can function on the lunar surface, namely because of the fact that we are working in such a challenging environment and the conditions are so, so abrasive. What you can see here on the screen is not only a render of the 3D printing technology that we are actively prototyping, but at the bottom, you can see some pictures uh, generated to show you some of the lab experiments that we have done with various different regular simulants having 99.9% .9 accuracy to those Apollo samples that I have mentioned. From left to right, you can see samples that were done with a sintering, middle picture is selective laser melting, and the far right hand side showcases fused deposition modeling. Uh, again, the, closed purpose, uh, the purpose for closed vacuum manufacturing in space has to do with how sealed chambers are able to maintain low pressure conditions to prevent external contamination from the factors of what is going on in space. In addition, as lunar regolith is being processed, melted or extruded, oxides present in the material are vaporized and released, which causes a large amount of oxygen buildup, which can act as a shielding material but in conjunction can also be captured for use in life support systems, further enabling the use for a closed vacuum manufacturing system. In addition, collection mechanisms, uh, such as uh, condenser plates and traps, are strategically placed within the chamber to be able to capture and accumulate the condensed oxide particles, which further inhibits the use of the vacuum system, allowing the system itself to function with absolute clarity. Um, going back to regolith now as a structural material, um, the varying particle size distribution and abrasive shape of the lunar highlands regolith enables the need for consistent interaction of rotation, translation, and inversion during the beneficiation stage of processing regolith in order to create a feedstock viable for additive manufacturing of complex geometries. This can be accomplished through processes like dual centrifugal mixing, as well as vibrational separation to reduce electrostatic charge. The beneficiation of cobbles and loose soil would undergo three-dimensional motion, inducing constantly changing and rhythmically pulsing states in the mixed material. This process yields high quality mixing results, meaning the most stringent requirements coupled with speed to offset gravitational distortion in these microgravity or reduced gravity environments. In addition, Space copies utilizing this pre-processing equipment in order to produce a powder that is more homogeneous. And I speak to the term homogeneous with uh, a bit of a caveat. Being able to specifically identify weights and particle sizes allows you to be able to create a feedstock that is durable and is more likely to work. So in developing this technology, what we are really looking at here is not only the engineering and the hardware of how space equipment is being put together for these applications, but also really, really getting down to examining how this technology is built in order to enable it to have a long lifespan, minimal maintenance requirements, and overall ease of use. Speaking about the lunar economy as an early market opportunity, which of course as an entrepreneur is vital, the space economy has a current value of 464 billion US dollars, which is slated to increase up to $1.8 trillion by 2040. In lunar manufacturing alone, we are slated to increase to a total addressable market of 7.5 billion US dollars per annum. And given the fact that, as mentioned before, lunar manufacturing is capable of reducing Earth to moon supply dependency by up to 70% using infrastructure built from in situ resources, allows us to really, really recognize how the lunar economy is now becoming the most fast paced growth induced economic market since the dot com bubble. I want to pause for a moment and really just inhibit this one particular phrase into everybody's mind. If there's one key takeaway from today's discussion, I want everybody here to know that additive manufacturing allows for sustainable use of local resources for rapid prototyping in extreme environments. This phrase is so important to understanding how 3D printing is able to manifest itself in space how we are able to use these local resources for rapid prototyping, and how in conjunction with the technology that we are sending up to the lunar surface, we are able to apply the same technology benefits down here on Earth to service combat zones for defense, natural disaster response areas, indigenous communities, and extreme environments, including subsea, Arctic, and desert, areas where you could not get standard infrastructure delivered. 
Speaking about us as a company, Space Copy is in its research and development process, and we aim to have a commercial prototype available for use in terrestrial environments as early as the end of 2025, with launch into space as early as 2028, and subsequent full-scale development well through the 2030s with the goal of eventually having one of our 3D printers being put onto Mars for enabled construction for human colonization. Speaking about the challenges, processes, and applications, though I will not spend too much time on this, I do want to note that the envir uh, environmental conditions of space, radiation exposure, thermal gradients causing temperature extremes, dust mitigation, and reduced gravity pose as severe challenges. How we have overcome some of those challenges includes thermal vacuum testing, um, going into laboratories and simulating micrometeorite showers, uh, engaging um, a plasma charging of lunar regolith simulants that as we are 3D printing, we can see how this material behaves. And then of course, putting the technology into a lunar analog environment, which is our plan over the next year in order to be able to in, uh, enable our technology to work in these extreme environments. Uh, wrapping up with trends, data, and research, um, there is a cited immediate cost savings when it comes to additive manufacturing in space just within its first operational year. I feel I've already kind of touched upon that concept, so I will not spend too much time on it. I will close out by showcasing one of the current ongoing research and development projects that we are conducting right now. This is the beneficiation or high speed dual centrifugal mixing of lunar regolith simulant that we are conducting to not only enhance the properties of that beneficiated regolith to have a finer particle size distribution for easier enabled additive manufacturing, but as part of our patent protected in situ material processing mechanism, we are analyzing how this type of mixing works in order to, um, to not only shape the particles to be less abrasive and more round, but also allow them to break down enhance their mechanical properties and see what kind of binding agents we can further use to enhance the uh, density and the compaction in between layers when conducting 3D printing using this specific type of regolith. Further investigation um, led by our team will now take this regolith simulant, conduct various different 3D printing ranging from bricks, tiles, more complex geometries like precision tooling and cylindrical parts, which will then be put under mechanical and structural testing ahead of full-scale prototype development. Our future initiatives, of course, are quite broad, but we cannot do it alone. We do need the support of the entire space community behind us. We are currently working with NASA to enable this technology to come to life, but we are actively seeking partnerships, collaborations, and the advice of the space community, especially with regards to material science and 3D printing. Being able to enable this closed-lived economy for in-situ resource utilization comes back to our vision of transforming human exploration methods. And I invite everybody here today to please be a part of that initiative and reach out to us if you have any further inquiries. So again, if you want to make contact with us, my email is here on the screen. You can also visit us at spacecopy.com or scan this QR code to learn more. Again, thank you to the Lunar Development Conference for hosting me today and happy International Moon Day. Thank you, Melissa, uh, for a very uh, interesting presentation and uh, congratulations to uh, uh, the progress so far. Thank you. Uh, we have um, at least one question here from Marufa, and that is, what is the budget for this project? Yes, I will ask this just to introduce myself. Hi, nice to meet you. Um, we are LinkedIn friends for a while. This is my logo in the background, kind of like showing my existence. <laughs> <more and more. laughs> so, I, Because I'm also an entrepreneur, founder and CEO of Everest Innovation Lab in Hawaii. So I, I'm curious about the budget the scale of budget, because NASA talks about million, billion dollars and as an entrepreneur. So what is your experience about budget, about your projects? And thank you. Well, thank you so very much for your question and pleasure to meet you here virtually. Um, to speak about the budgeting, and this is something that I say is a little bit difficult to ascertain. 
We did, as a company, close out on a pre-seed round of $150,000 last year just to enable the early stage research and development. But of course, we realized that projects like this, sending a 3D printer to the moon is going to be quite cost heavy. For our terrestrial applications of just getting this 3D printer built and sent out to an extreme environment here on Earth, such as the desert or the Arctic, we are budgeting $3 million to be able to build that prototype and send it out. Uh, we will be raising that seed round starting at the end of this year. Uh, to be able to send the technology to space, though, we do realize that prototyping costs are going to increase significantly. So we are budgeting around $10 million to be able to get a very basic prototype built out and sent to the International Space Station, uh, with the lunar launch cost being probably double that um, number. So we do necess uh, necessitate that we will need to rely on government funding and non dilutive opportunities in order to get us across that finish line, which is why we're pleased to be working with the government in its capacities. But also, I do believe that, if, especially as an entrepreneur, this allows us to actually kind of manifest where space funding is going, taking a good look at the economy and seeing uh, what can we do to have um, a dual use technology that is enabled here on Earth that will further support the use case of going to space so that when it comes to building out these really complex technologies, we as entrepreneurs are able to better seek investor funding by being able to prove out these concepts. So long story short, I'm looking at that budget of 3 million to send something uh, just out here on Earth and at least 10 million to get us to the International Space Station with lunar launch costs being, of course, higher than that. But collaboration between government and being able to really communicate your value proposition as an entrepreneur, I'm sure will be able to help us not only raise those funds, but also to try and break down some barriers for other space entrepreneurs to enter into this arena. Yes, uh, I would be in interested in partnership. Um, do you have uh, like a la laboratory in US or somewhere? We do a great deal of our research and development out of various different laboratories, none that we specifically call, call our own, but we work out of various uh, academic institutions and also a private laboratory in um, Florida. So if you are interested in, again, collaboration, partnership opportunities, I'm always happy to facilitate that discussion. I encourage you to reach out to me or visit spacecopy.com. We have a form you can fill in for that kind of interest and happy to have that conversation. We have various different R&D projects when it comes to working with regolith or 3D printing or just throwing micro meteorites at bricks and seeing if they break apart. <laughs> so again, lots of exciting stuff going on here, but thank you so much for your question. You're welcome. Thanks. And thank you so much. I, I had I had one question as well, actually, and that that's you mentioned you needed to maintain low pressure for for the process. Uh, why do you need pressure? Well, of course, this depends a little bit, I should say, on the application. Uh, specifically for subsea applications, being able to maintain low pressure allows the system to be able to better calibrate when you're adjusting mm -hmm. to different environments. Uh, maybe so for the space application, it's not quite as relevant, but being able to maintain an internal vacuum system that is maintaining um, temperature, it's maintaining, well, I, I suppose it is somewhat maintaining the pressure of the system, being able to keep that constant allows for not only, if we're speaking about laser powder bed fusion, allows not only for the material not to rise up, the particulate not to start floating around, but it also allows um, for the context of extrusion-based technology, for the nozzle of the 3D printer that's actually extruding out the filament to not get super clogged up when it comes to doing those different kinds of 3D printing experiments. So it is a little bit challenging to understand. However, pressure, temperature, and reduced gravity conditions are the basic three factors that allow the flowability of the filament to extrude out smoothly. So being able to maintain somewhat of a consistency through a vacuum system is how we've best been able to kind of develop a concept that's going to mitigate that challenge. Okay, uh, sounds good. Um, thank you. And that, that was the uh, make timer. Now uh, the, the next speaker might be a bit uh, lenient on, on time because that's me, but I, I think that's a good way to break anyway. So thank you a lot for an interesting presentation and good luck. Thank you very much.